What's up, everyone? This is Michael Cashew, and you're listening to the Brute Strength Podcast. This week, I interviewed American record-holding weightlifter Jessica Lucero. Jessica is a 58-kilo lifter. She's been lifting for 12 years, and this year won nationals and broke the American uh, senior American snatch record. Before doing this interview, I had no idea how insightful Jessica was, but she shared some serious life wisdom as well as a lot of things that set her apart as a professional in the sport of weightlifting. Uh, before we get started, if you have 20 seconds, I would love if you could leave me a review. You can do that by going to brutestrengthtraining.com backslash podcast backslash reviews. Enjoy the show. Hey, Jess. Hey. How are you? Great. How are you? Very good. Um, how is it being in San Jose training with your coach lately? Um, it's been so nice just having somebody there watching me and cheering for me. It's been great. Good. Good time to be out there as well with yeah. uh, nationals coming up or totally. uh, trials. Yeah. Well, cool. Thank you so much for making time for this. I'm excited. Me too. So remind me, I think you've been lifting for 12 years. Is that right? Yeah. Since, well, since 2004. Okay. So, mm -hmm. yeah, coming up on 12 years. Um, mm -hmm. So this year you won nationals and you broke the American snatch record. And I think you uh, you unofficially broke another record or two, right? Yeah. <laughs> so what was that experience like for you this year? Um, it's been great. It's been good building from each performance and learning from mistakes that I made and um, just trying to grow and get better. So what was it like standing up on, not even the podium, you're still on the platform, you just broke the snatch record, and mm -hmm. your 12 years of um, training culminated in that. Like, what was that, what did that feel like? Oh, gosh. Um, I mean, it was pretty surreal, but I was just so, I just felt so blessed and just happy. <laughs> mm -hmm. I don't know. I, I just feel like I've worked really, really hard and I've gone through a lot of things um, to get to where I am and to be the athlete that I am today. And so, you know, I earned it. And so it was cool to see it all, you know, come together, Absolutely. at least for one piece of it. Right, right. So let's back up a couple years. Nationals 2014, you went okay. zero for six. Right. What was <laughs> what was that feeling like? Um, honestly, like at that meet specifically, I I had no idea who I was as an athlete. I had no idea what I needed mentally um, to succeed, and I had no idea. Like, I just didn't know myself at all. Mm -hmm. So my training hadn't been going very great going into that meet. So I was like debating whether I should go anyways for like the, the three weeks or so before that. Um, and then like last minute I decided to go and just go and have fun and whatever. And in the moment I was like thinking about these other lifters that I had looked up to in the past. And I was like, just be them, just be them. And it stopped myself from being me. And I didn't know how to not be myself. And even though I had no confidence in myself and what I was capable of, that was still going to be better than me pretending to be someone else and trying mm -hmm. to like move like someone else or whatever in that moment out of nowhere. So I think it was a good learning experience regardless. And it was a big turning point in my career because I had to, you know, take a step back and think, you know, what is going on with me? What do I want? Do I want to keep lifting? What are my goals? What, what needs to be happening for them to come true? And what am I missing? And so I did a lot of like soul searching and really learned about myself. Um, what kind of things did you deeper learn? Deeper level. If you don't mind well, me asking. Well, I learned like, for one, that, I mean, the, the reasons that I didn't believe in myself weren't because of myself, like I didn't just like make them up. Like I learned that I took a lot of things personal that, um, you know, I people have said to me in the past growing up and and things like 
people telling me I wasn't going to be anything and I wasn't good enough and, and I would never be good enough, you know, and all of that as an athlete, well, as a person, you hold on to those things. And so as an athlete, I had to kind of figure out, like, if I wanted to do something, I can't be, if I wanted to be somebody in the sport, I can't be holding on to things like that. Like, I don't care what somebody else thinks about me or said about me way back then when I was a kid and, mm -hmm. and wasn't anything yet. Like, I have to earn it and I have to believe it and I have to be it. So I kind of realized, like, I needed to let some of that go. And so that was really hard to do. It took me a couple of years to completely let it go. And then, like, still, even to this day, I in training sessions, like, if they're not going that well, my natural instinct will go back to, like, thinking about myself in that negative way or, you know, being so hard on myself and thinking that I, I'm not good enough or I'm not going to be good enough. And so it kind of taught me to be aware of my thinking in that way. Right. So not allow myself to do that anymore. That's, that's really interesting. And I don't think that's a Jessica Lucero problem. I think that's a human problem in general. Oh, Every, yeah, everybody's sure. got their, you know, their negative self-talk, their trigger spots. What did, like a little more specifically, what did that work that you did on yourself look like? Was it just a series of conversations? Uh, any like techniques that you used? Can you um, walk us through that at all? Yeah. So like, well, really it started, um, I moved back home to be closer to my family. So it really started there with my family. And I just kind of, you know, was focusing on things that made me happy instead of focusing on things that like I wasn't fulfill being fulfilled in or, you know, stepping up and being the athlete that I wanted to be. Like I wasn't focusing solely on like my worth based mm -hmm. on weightlifting or my worth based on um, how much money I was making or, you know, any of those things. I was just focusing on the things that made me happy. And then I met my husband and he was um, amazing in this department because, you know, I, I realized like I was worthy to have somebody as amazing as him. And, mm -hmm. and, and he showed me every day. Well, he leads me in so many different ways, but, but one of them being just believing in yourself and, and how he does it himself. Like he's been through a lot of things growing up too. And, you know, he's a very strong man and he, is really strong in his faith and he leans on God and he, he, um, helps other people and he focuses on the good things and he gives thanks every night and, you know, not, not holding on to like, Oh, this didn't go the, my way. Okay. Well, that's fine. Like it doesn't change your life. It doesn't change who you are. It's, it's okay. So, you know, just like re focusing on what's important was big for me. And then I did start working with the sports psychologist, but not until um, like uh, maybe two months before nationals okay. uh, last year. So I had worked through a lot of that stuff um, before that anyways. And my coach, Amy, she's been really good, good for me with that too. Like kind of giving me goals for each workout. Like um, even if they're little things, like my goal for you is to have no misses on this exercise. And the exercise might've been like a really light drill. Mm -hmm. you know, and just like allowing myself to have successes and letting myself be okay with having success and allowing myself to succeed in general. Um, and then she would make me say things like, um, you know, tell me the five great, greatest things that happened in your workout. And even if my workout was really terrible, I, you know, had to think in that way to be able to give her an answer. So right. that was huge too. Tell, tell me a little bit more about this thing that you said. You said you two years ago you were focused on trying to be like other girls. Mm -hmm. um, what is that? What? Are, yeah. Can you go into a little more depth into with that? Yeah. Um, so I had a bunch of lifters like when I was growing up that I would watch. Amy being one of them. Um, Natalie Bergner. I'm sure you've heard of her. Absolutely. Um, being another. Chris Gump. Um, Kara heads. So basically like I would watch all of them lift and they all lift very differently. Um, and they all have different qualities about them that made them amazing lifters separately. So <clears throat> like their stage presence and how they approach the bar and how they needed to be mentally in the back room. And, you know, I asked them so many questions like, you know, how did you, 
what do you think about in the warm up area? What do you think about when you're on the stage? What do you think about the week leading up to the trials or mm -hmm. to the competition? Um, <clears throat> I would ask them things like that, just me learning and me curious as a kid. And I think that when I wasn't feeling good about what I was doing or I didn't mm -hmm. feel confident about how I had been thinking about myself or my training leading up to a competition, I would be like, okay, well, Natalie said she did this, so I'm right. going to do that. Um, and then at a competition, like I would remember how, um, Amy would approach a bar and I would approach the bar in the exact same way that she was. And mm -hmm. I'd be like, okay, lift like Amy. And I'd be like, she's super fast in her turnover. Um, just do that. And, and it would take away from my body and my movements and like things that I need to like, cue myself to do because of, you know, things that I need to work on. Right. That makes For example, sense. yeah. Like my early arm bends, like I have to be really conscious of it. Um, and if I bend too early, you know, the bar is in the wrong place in my hips and I don't get full extension and then the bar is way out in front of me. And so it causes me to miss. So I have to be really conscious, like, okay, set up, um, tighten your lats, not your arms, you know, like things like that. Like those are things that I need to do for my body to make me successful. And I threw all those things away. Instead, I was thinking about, you know, how to move like Amy or Natalie or right. Krista. So if you, if you could go back you're 27 now 26 <laughs> okay 26 if you could go if you could go back and tell your 15 somewhere in, in the 15 to 20 range let's say 17 yeah. year old self okay what, what would you do differently in that department um i probably would have wanted to learn about myself sooner and and learn what what would work best for me sooner and focus on that and um, instead of everybody else. I think that I spent a lot of time looking at, at and making false idols, you know, nobody's perfect. And every single one of those lifters that I looked up to, like they had things that they had to work on and, mm -hmm. and that necessarily I didn't see. So I, I think that I would have, you know, focused on my development as a person and as an athlete more instead of, um, trying to be somebody that I wasn't. Mm -hmm. I think that's um, one thing that I really wish that I would have gotten a hold of sooner because my growth from I, when I figured that out until now has been crazy. And I just wonder like where I would be now if, you know, that would have happened sooner. But mm -hmm. everything that I went through, I feel like I went through for a reason and it's made me stronger and tougher than I would have been if I hadn't gone through it. So I do wish I would have known, like, I'm curious, but I'm glad it happened the way it did right. also. That's a great answer. Um, so you, you, I'm, I'm sure that you've already given a lot of the answer to this f following question, but what else has changed? So, you know, two years, two years ago, you go zero to zero for six. This uh -huh. year you win nationals and set an American record. What what other things have changed that have allowed for such like rapid improvement and success? Well, I feel like mentality is so big um, and uh, like being able to focus on my self-talk and making sure that I'm even if it was a bad lift, like being aware of how I'm communicating with myself is huge. Um, but also like. What does I that had mean, a, communicating um, with yourself? So, so just my thoughts in my head. Like, for example, if I miss a lift in the gym, do I, like, allow myself to freak out and be like, this means, like, this is such a low percentage. Why would you be missing this? this you should never miss this way. Like, talking mm -hmm. to myself, talking down to myself. Or being like, okay, that was weird. That's not me. Why did I miss it? And let's correct it on the next one. Um, makes such a big difference because if you're talking, like think about it, if you're like yelling at somebody and you're mad at them, like they're going to feel bad. And so if you're doing <laughs> right. that to yourself, if you're doing that to yourself after every mislift or everything that goes wrong, like that builds up every single day. It's and called abuse. Yeah. So uh, like I was abusing myself. Right. right. <laughs> um, so that has made a big difference. And then a lot of people in my life have really stepped up to help me grow and be more aware of when I am doing that to myself because mm -hmm. I do talk a lot. So like if I'm talking out loud to my coach and I'm saying like, 
oh gosh, like, well, that was my opener and, you know, I can't even do my opener today. And right. she's like, Jess, that's not, that's not a thing. Like you just did it yesterday. Like you shouldn't, like, it's okay. You know, mm-hmm. things like that, like holding me accountable for how I'm communicating with myself and then having like constant reassurance from the people that love me that they love me no matter what. And, and God loves me no matter what, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't mean I have to be a national champion or uh, American record holder to have love or to be loved. Mm-hmm. Um, that was huge. It, it changed the way that I looked at it. It was more exciting and fun and not um, pressure. Like I have to do this or, you know, I'm right. not loved or I'm not worthy. Oh man, that's, that's powerful stuff. That's, that's stuff that I think everyone should do, whether they're an athlete or not for sure. Oh yeah. That, oh yeah. I totally kind of agree. Searching. That's awesome. What has been your motivation over the last 12 years? I mean, weightlifting is, um, it, it can be mundane and boring at times. It, you know, you can go yeah. months and years without hitting a PR. What have yeah. been the things that keep you going? Um, I think so what's important is not to like get ahead of yourself. Um, it, it's hard because there are so many steps and if you have an end goal, that's that's say the Olympics, for example, and you started when you're 14, (laughs) like before you're developmentally ready to, to be there, um, it takes time. And so I always had the Olympics in my head. Like I always wanted to go, but I knew there was a lot of steps before I could get there. Mm -hmm. And so I just kind of real, and, and it's easy to get overwhelmed and like, there's so much to do. There's so much to grow on. There's, there's so much I need to get better on before I'm going to be ready to make an Olympic team. So I think like what's really hard to do, but the most important thing to do is really stay present in what you're doing at that moment. So whether you're at home, like right now, getting ready to go train at 11 or 11:30, like I need to be stretching. I need to be making sure my body is loose before I get there. And making sure that I'm, I have everything that I need to be successful for this day. Mm-hmm. And then when I get to the gym, warming up correctly, um, doing my drills that will help me move the barbell more efficiently. Um, and then in my workout, like focusing on that movement at that moment. So like when I set up for a snatch, I'm thinking about what I have to do, what my job is for that movement in that particular second and not getting overwhelmed with what this weight means or Mm -hmm. what I have to do next or how many more reps I have. Like sometimes if I have on the minute snatches and I have like 25 total snatches, if I look at that number and count it all up, like that's super overwhelming, but I don't think about it. I just think, okay, I just have one snatch Mm -hmm. and then I do the one snatch and I'm like, okay, I have another snatch. (laughs) Like that's it. Right. Um, so that, that makes it a lot easier to not be overwhelmed and like discouraged with the amount of work that you have to do. Um, and like to have fun every day. Like I genuinely get up excited every day to train. And, and even when I was going through like hard times in weightlifting, I still felt that, which was like the the weirdest feeling when you like love and (laughs) hate something at the same time. So I think that that makes it you know, more enjoyable and whatever, like the people that you're surrounding yourself with and training and, um, your goals and like just making, like letting, allowing yourself to have like little wins every day. I think Mm -hmm. is good. That's so insightful. What you said about, um, you know, remaining present. That's, that's, you know, what I've always read and experienced for myself on the Mm -hmm. way to enjoy anything, right? Enjoy being in a relationship or, you know, like school or whatever it may be, just remaining present with what you're doing right now is the, is the way to enjoy it, be, be more successful, uh, more stress-free, all of those types of things. So that's, yeah, it's a really good metaphor for just about anything you want to do. So I love Yeah. And it's, it's so crazy to me how hard that is. Like, it seems like such a simple task, but it's like, it's not, it's so hard. Mm -hmm. It definitely can be. And it's, it's really, it's just as simple as like continuing to remind yourself to become aware Mm -hmm. of whatever it is you're doing, right? Focus on what you're doing. Um, and not like a, an intense focus necessarily, but just 
if, if, your, if your mind starts to drift off on what does this weight, weight mean, using your example, mm-hmm. um, you know, just let it float away. It's just a thought, right? And then mm-hmm. bring your awareness back to the lift that you're doing. Right. And it's totally natural for your mind to wonder, like your mind is so complex. You you don't always have control over Mm -hmm. what's going on, but you can always bring it back. So that that was like a hard one for me to learn, too, that, you know, it's okay. Like I I would get mad at myself that I would think that even so I would find Mm -hmm. a new thing to be frustrated with myself. on. (laughs) Absolutely. And then I'd be like, okay, well, it's all right. That's natural. Anyways, this is what I should be thinking. Mm hmm. I got a, this is out in left field a little bit, um, but why do you only follow one person on Instagram? <laughs> Actually, I follow two now. I follow you my do? mom. And, nice. <laughs> yeah, I followed nice my mom the other day. Um, I try to say, like, so when I, I use social media um, to, to reach others and um, it's not necessarily for me, you know, like showing off what I'm doing or, you know, being boastful or anything like that. I want to be able to reach others in their growth and their development and whatever they're doing. So if that's weightlifting or if that's CrossFit or if that's gymnastics, who knows? Like Mm -hmm. I look at gymnastics, like high level gymnastics, Instagram all the time. And I do not do gymnastics. I'm not very (laughs) talented at gymnastics whatsoever, (laughs) but I'm super like inspired by them. And you know, just like random fitness girls, things like that. Um, and so, and also like, like women who are starting weightlifting now in their, you know, forties, like, I, I just want to be able to show people that, you know, everyone has their own journey and, um, it doesn't, it doesn't always happen overnight. Like some people it does and that's okay, but some people it doesn't. And the, to just like, love yourself no matter what you're doing. And I don't know, I just want to be an example for the, the journey taking a long time and, right. you know, s- sticking it out and keep fighting and keep working and, and keep staying positive. Um, so I don't really need to follow anybody for that reason. You know, like I'm not using Instagram as a social thing for me where I'm like, Oh, I want to see what everyone's doing or, I want to stay connected, connected with people. I feel like Facebook is m- more for that for mm-hmm. me anyways. Um, especially for my like friends from high school and my family and things like that. Um, but I do like to know what Christian's doing on Instagram and mm-hmm. uh, my mom and, and whatever, but, but yeah, it, it, it's easy to get distracted on Instagram. And so when I was following a bunch of people, like I would realize I was spending so much time on Instagram and instead of like, I could have been doing recovery things or I could have been doing, you know, mm-hmm. anything reading. I could have been outside enjoying the day. Like I, I could have been spending my time in other ways. And so it just helps me stay focused on the task of why I have Instagram and the point of having Instagram for me anyways, um, which is totally fine if that's not why you're using Instagram, sure. but that's just for me. And um, so, yeah, it just helps me kind of stay focused when I'm on there to not like spend all day on it. <laughs> right. That makes perfect sense. Before, before I started Brute, I would delete my Facebook account and and before I wasn't even on Instagram for the first few yeah. years, but I deleted my Facebook account three or four times because, because of these reasons, I would always come back to this yeah. realization that I'm really not using this, um, in the healthiest way. Right. It's more of like right. an escape when I could be doing more productive things, but now, you know, it's such a big part of an online company. So it's, it's hard to do, but I, right. uh, I totally understand that. Yeah. But like, even if it's an online company too, if you're like using it for good and like your intentions mm-hmm. are pure, as long as like you're still enjoying what you're doing, I feel like that's still fine. But for me, it's like, I don't know, like not only do I spend all day on it, but then it'll like, I'll start to like look at other people and compare myself to others and even not even weightlifters like even mm-hmm. just like these beautiful fitness women on there like I'm like oh my gosh like I am so thick like I'm not cute <laughs> like you know just it just just terrible terrible things mm-hmm. that I would say to myself just from like looking at them or like being envious of other people and it's just not good for you right 
yeah, it's, it's really difficult to do sometimes. Um, you know, we, we can all of a sudden compare ourselves to every single person in the world. Yeah. And all we're seeing is these, these perfect, for the most part, perfect highlights of this person's life. Right. And so right. we're, we're under this illusion that, all these people have perfect lives and they're, they are perfect. And, and so it's, it's can be really challenging not to compare yourself in a negative way. Yeah, no, it's so true. And, and I try to remember that too, when I'm posting, like, like, I don't always have to post like the greatest things that have ever happened to me. Like, right. That's, that's, those are special moments for you anyways. Like you don't always need to share everything, Mm -hmm. but yeah, totally. Um, okay. I want to, talk a little more like technical questions about weightlifting. Okay. Um, I th- I, over the past couple years, I think you went from a 58 to a 63 back to a 58. What was yeah. that? What was that all about? Um, so <clears throat> when I was, I was living at the training center at the time and then I moved out to San Jose to train with Greg and Amy. Um, <clears throat> and I was a 58 the whole time I was at the OTC. I like literally, I went, once I moved up to 58, I stayed at 58. I tried to move up to 63 um, as a junior, like in 2009 and I could not do it. It was so hard. I couldn't do it. And, um, my body just wasn't ready. I was, I don't know. But anyway, um, I had a huge breakup Mm -hmm. (laughs) and, um, when I moved out to San Jose, I was like, you know, feeling really sorry for myself and really depressed. And, um, my cortisol was really, really high. And so I started to gain weight because of that. Um, like the chemical imbalances in my mm-hmm. body, I guess. Um, and then I switched over to full paleo to try to um, lose that weight. And it ended up making me gain more weight because wow. of all, could be, because it's not paleo's fault. It's because <laughs> I thought it was okay to eat um, almond butter at any point of the day right. because it's paleo. <laughs> so I would have like an entire tube of paleo, uh-huh. I mean of almond butter like in one day. So it's not technically paleo's fault, but... I got a little carried away. Um, Dip, dipping the bacon in, yeah, the, in the almond butter. In the almond butter. Oh, yeah. my gosh. Um, yeah. So, like, I, one thing led to another thing, and then I was pretty heavy. And then um, when I – after – at that Nationals, I was, like, that I went zero for six. I was, like, starting to come down in my body weight, too. Um, like, naturally, I think I weighed in at, like – 60 point something which was like the lightest that I had been for like that whole year after I left or mm-hmm. I got to San Jose like I had gotten up to like like 65 kilos which I'm 5'2 like it's not a bad thing to weigh that much at 5'2 but it wasn't good weight so it wasn't like muscle it was like all in my cheeks so mm-hmm. <laughs> um I was glad that it was starting to come down and and at that point I just decided you know I was going to eat to make me happy and not, and when I was hungry and not overdo it and not underdo it, just like listen to my body. And I just did that. And then I started to get down. I was like, when I moved back to Florida, I was like back to 59 and I made weight at a local meet maybe a month after, sorry, a month after I moved home. So Mm -hmm. it came back pretty, pretty quickly as I started to like, you know, reassess my my life and focusing on what makes me happy and things like that. Like just Mm. not being so depressed all the time. Right. Um, but I don't think it wasn't, it was definitely not an intentional thing. I think that eventually I will want to go up to 63 full time, which I have never told anybody that yet. So (laughs) you heard it here first guys. Yeah. Hopefully I don't get in trouble for that. But, um, (laughs) yeah. So I do think that I like my body is ready to move up to 63 in Mm -hmm. a healthy way. And I think mentally I'm like ready for a new challenge. So, um, you know, after the Olympics, of course. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's what happened there. (laughs) Gotcha. Gotcha. What, uh, what rituals do you have, uh, in regards to training and competition? So, you know, things that you do every day you train or the day of a meet, anything like that. So, um, at home in the morning before I train, I always do like, so I'm either reading a book or, um, I'll like corny as it sounds, pick a spot in the Bible and read a little bit and take some notes. And like, um, sometimes it doesn't make any sense to what's going on in my life. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's like so spot on, it's crazy. Um, 
during the world championships, it was so spot on. It was like almost freaky, Mm -hmm. but, um, but you know, either way, I just try to refocus on God and, um, and have him as my priority. And then, um, you know, making sure I'm doing all my recovery stuff. Like I'll do a morning warming thing that we do at the Olympic training center. I'll do that at home every morning before I train. And then I go train and then, um, usually like I pray right before I start my workout. Um, and then in a competition, same thing, except for I do like a, like once every, once a week I do like a mental walkthrough of the competition Mm -hmm. and, um, where like I close my eyes and I literally walk myself through the success of the entire competition. Mm -hmm. And so So all um, the lifts, all walking to and from the chalk bucket, all of that stuff. Um, (laughs) so I'll, I'll think about, um, how weigh-ins will be. So Mm -hmm. like what it'll feel like to be around all of the competitors that I'm competing against. Um, and then like, how I'm handling it, what my face looks like, how my emotions are, all of that. And then it kind of like blacks out and fast forward to like the competition. Mm -hmm. Um, Then in the competition, I'll go through, you know, the intros and how that's going to feel. And if I have butterflies, what my face looks like, how I look to other people, um, how I'm feeling emotionally. And then I go into the competition. So yeah, from the chalk tray to the platform, I I, like it's preference. Sometimes I look at it from like a perspective of me actually doing it. And sometimes I look at it like a movie Okay, kind of depends. I I don't really know why that happens, but it does. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, And then I'll see myself like making all six of my lifts and then my reactions afterwards Um, and how it feels afterwards. And, you know, being able to embrace Amy and Mm -hmm. Christian and, all of that. Um, and I'm curious, did you did you just start doing that naturally or did the sports site tell you to start this, this imagery? So a little both. Okay, so when I was in high school, my coach then told me to do that. And I would do it overkill. Like I mm-hmm. would be in class and I would be like <laughs> thinking about – I would be like thinking about every – like just lifting over and over and over again. And I would get so like mentally fatigued mm-hmm. that by the time I would get to a competition, it was like – too much and I was so tired wow so then I stopped doing it for a while and then my sports psych brought it in again and he's like well this is the way that you should approach it and and with your breathing and not letting yourself actually get emotional during it and you know um staying calm and feeling confident and all that where like I think I was doing it when I was a kid and I was feeling really anxious while I was doing it and really tense the whole time so I think that was part of why it wasn't Mm -hmm. as successful then and I didn't really understand what I was doing so so now I definitely have more um direction right you understand why yeah why it's important to do it yeah and and I think that it's so crazy because like other sports like they don't it's not as cut and dry like Mm -hmm. I I can't imagine how like a soccer player for example would do that like there's no you you have no idea what your reaction is going to be to a certain Mm -hmm. play like you can't control how the outcome of the game is going and like how you respond to certain um, situations really and in CrossFit for example you have no idea what the next workout is so how do you like mentally prepare for those things like well I think I think it's I, I definitely see what you're saying but I think soccer players they know their game so intimately that they can dissect mm-hmm. it into these into these like very small pieces to where they can they can practice the same type of imagery with like the same their play context. exactly yeah um and that's you know any any top performer can can dissect and and mm-hmm. do this kind of work and that's the you know i always talk about you know the the professionals the the best of the best are willing to do the little things that others aren't and this is one of right. those little things that can have a huge benefit it doesn't make you t- more tired right if you're right. if you're not allowing it to make you super emotional but it can have a huge impact on your performance your stress levels all that stuff yeah totally and that's you know not something that i well, I, maybe I was willing to do, but didn't know how to do. I just didn't know myself well enough yet previously to mm-hmm. this year or last year. Right. So, yeah. Uh, back to, back to the ritual. Anything else? Oh, um, no, I think that's it. I, um, 
I, well, I'll do the same thing in a competition that I do in training. So I'll like read a little bit and mm-hmm. pray before I start. And um, I'm usually like really present in prayer, like the whole workout, which I don't know is, if it's cheesy or not, but it really helps me. Like the first time that I snatched um, 92 in training was at World Team Training Camp. Um, and I was like pretty much talking to God like the entire workout. Mm-hmm. And it, and um, it just helps me like know what's really important and stay calm and have that like fire when I need it. Right. Maybe that's a way for you to stay positive. Yeah, probably. Keep, keep a positive self-talk and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, what is, what's your diet like? The, the rumor is that you eat pancakes and bacon the morning of <laughs> your weigh-ins. How, do you, oh, yeah. how are you able to do that? I should have probably said that's part of my ritual. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so I work with a D with Working Against Gravity. And, um, the like, a D? A D. The a D. <laughs> the amazing a D. Um, so she, I text her every morning my body weight, and um, which I, I, I'm definitely like lucky to have her do that for me because I know that typically they do like weekly check ins, and she's like super involved with me. Um, and making sure that, you know, I'm getting the foods that I need, um, exactly the foods that I need, not more, you know. And um, so she counts my macros for me and she changes them on the fly. Like if I was a little bit heavier or retaining water, you know, anything weird was going on. Um, it's an easy fix and it's um, she's always there to help me. And then we always prepare for weigh-ins. So like we know exactly what time my weigh-in is going to be. And, um, and if it's like early enough, then I might not necessarily eat, but I usually, she usually sets it up so that I can eat. And that's like such a comforting feeling because I used to have to cut weight really hard for 58. Mm -hmm. Um, I wouldn't ever weigh more than 60. Well, I'd weigh like 61 maybe. Mm -hmm. Um, so but that's, that's about still, six pounds, a little over six pounds. Right. But, but like in like perspective for weight classes, that's not really that heavy. Like mm-hmm. I, like as a 63, that would be like super, super light. So I was still definitely a 58, but I did have to cut a lot. And so I would have to like plan for like a water weight cut and, you know, saunaing and like just doing all of that drama. And so it's really like stress free now that I have a D because we just do it all by food. I never have mm-hmm. to get in the sauna, knock on wood. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I never have to um, do a water weight cut. The only thing is she'll be like, okay, no water today, like the day of the weigh-ins, and she'll make me weigh my water that day. But I usually get water in the morning, and I um, I always am craving pancakes with syrup and bacon and, mm-hmm. and or waffles. But, like, it's just I don't normally crave that. But on a competition day, I always want it for some reason. So <laughs> that's usually – what I get. <laughs> and is it, so uh, there are the obvious benefits of not cutting a bunch of water for your clean and jerk. So you're, yeah. so you can stand up with the weight. How, do, how does it affect you mentally? Just knowing that's something you don't have to worry about. Um, well, it's really, so I used to feel like really weird when I would li- be lifting on weight because I never, I never lifted at that weight. So my body composition was very different when I was training before. And so when I'd be clean and jerking the weights on a competition day, they always felt much different. My, my movement was different. Um, how they felt on my shoulders were different. My body would do weird things like this little, like snake, I can't even describe it. Like Mm -hmm. this little wiggle standing Mm -hmm. up from my cleans. Um, and this is, you're, you're talking about pre, Pre-AD. Pre-AD, got it. <laughs> um, and so now that I'm on weight all the time, I, I know exactly what to expect when I get, get to um, mm-hmm. the platform. So I know what it's going to feel like. And even if I'm like more tired or stressed or whatever, and it, like at a local meet or something, I don't have that extra like my body is different, my the weights are going to feel much heavier. Like it's, it's just a, a, a really – secure feeling Mm -hmm. knowing like nothing has changed on my body um 
And then also it's really nice to be able to eat and not feel like really full when I'm lifting. Cause sometimes what'll happen. Well, actually, yeah. Okay. So sometimes what would used to happen was I wouldn't eat anything for like almost two days mm-hmm. and then do that crazy water weight cut in the sauna and the bathtub and this weird thing and when I get on the stage I would or when I was done weighing in I would eat so much that my belly would be so full and mm-hmm. I like could not move right. and I just felt like every time I was leaning over to pick up the bar I was like burping and like it just felt so gross right and now I don't get that really I still get like a power belly from eating but no, yeah. that's a good thing just enough just enough right yeah it's really interesting to me I think honestly I think some people you know, can find a benefit from cutting a small amount of weight. Uh, they have an added benefit psychologically of not having to worry about what they eat as well as maybe they feel a little bit stronger. But for the most part, uh, I think it's just a cop out. You know, people don't yeah. want to put in the, the time and effort into watching what they eat. Um, and so they say, you know, they, they just use the excuse, you know, I, I'm willing to cut. It'll make me stronger on on game day or whatever. Yeah, and that's kind of like what you said earlier about like the best of the best. They'll they're willing to do whatever it takes and mm-hmm. and those little things. And like I tell everyone that asks me about working against gravity, I'm like it's so amazing, but it's a lot of work. So if you're not willing to work, it's not you're not gonna like it. Right. Like it's so much work. And and every single day, like weighing out every meal, like I can't lie that it's like hard on me some days. But like it's so worth it. And and in the end goal, like. And on those days that it's hard, I'm always like, Christian, I don't want to weigh my food today. And he'd be mm-hmm. like, it'll be worth it. Like, right. And he reminds me like why I'm doing it. Nice. And, yeah. Good job, Christian. Yeah. <laughs> cool. It's, uh, it's also, you know, there, there are always outliers that can perform at the highest level with terrible co- body composition. Um, you know, you just look at some football players. They look like complete shit, but they move like absolute freaks. But what are the majority of those top performers doing, right? They are shredded beyond belief. And, right. and your body composition, although it may be hard, it's it's one of a very few things that you do have control over. You have no control over what your competitors lift, you know, or sometimes of, of what you lift on game day, right? You can give your best effort, but you have total control over your body composition. Right. right? So you just have to put in the effort beforehand. Yeah, and it's okay if it's a lot of work. That's part of your training. Absolutely. So I have a few more questions before we wrap up. Okay. Um, what has been the biggest aha moment of of your career or what has made the single biggest impact on your performance from beginning to end? Or I say beginning till now. Um, well, like obviously that mental change on – how I was talking to myself but that's like a constant thing so Mm -hmm. it's hard to be like oh there was one moment that I did it and one moment that I didn't and it was just like one thing that I said to myself where it all came together it's it's constantly working hard to do that so it's a progression day by day and some days are better than others um but that that still is a big one and then um I think that um some technique stuff that I worked on with Amy like with my elbows being straighter and, you know, taking the time to work on getting my lower back strong and not relying on my quads as much when I'm snatching, um, was really big. Um, it took some time to develop the back strength to be able to like hold my positions better and be able to move more efficiently in that way. And so that took some time, but once I finally like developed that strength and was able to move better, um, my snatches were like nine day different. And then I've had like multiple aha jerk moments, um, but you know, where it just once came fixed, together, yeah, or, they just or something. Someone said something that made it click. Um, yeah, we're like so, someone would say something to make it click, or I would watch. Christian's actually really good at jerking, and um, whenever I watch him, I'm always like, oh. <laughs> but then I forget, like mm-hmm. the next day. So like, I've had a a bunch of things with jerks on and off, but I think the biggest thing that I started doing is like actually having a focal point during like in between my clean and my jerk. So when I'm like taking a breath, I'm actually thinking about something and I'm not just like, okay, now I'm going to jerk and just jerking, like actually having a purpose and intention in that part of my lift too. Like that's not a break. It's not a resting point. It's like, it's an, it's a point to be able to reset and think about what I'm doing next. 
Um, so that was a big aha moment too also. That's awesome. What one piece of advice would you give to beginner weightlifters? Um, I would tell them to be patient and to trust that it takes a long time to develop to, the strength to be able to move properly. And then that um, even if you have really big goals, you don't need to rush the process. Like the the better you are at the little things, the better and more potential you'll have with the bigger things. I like that. Focus on the little things. And yeah. then who has been your biggest role model um, since you started weightlifting? Um, I would say Amy and Natalie. I have so many. Like that whole generation of lifters, I just think they were so amazing and they really like paved the way for us. And even the generation before that, like Robin Goad and and – I just, they're just all so amazing. Like all the women that came before mm -hmm. us, they're all role models to me. And now you're one of them. Oh, so cool. thank you. Absolutely. Um, where can people find you on social media? So they can follow me on Instagram at Jessica Lucero nine, or I've been really into Snapchat lately and that's nice. at Jessica Lucero. I mean, actually that's not true. It's Jessica S nine, seven, nine. Cool. Yeah. Check her out, guys. Okay. Thank you so much, Jessica. I really appreciate yeah. it. You yeah, no problem. Day. Thanks for having me.